my stepdad and my sister waited at the door, I was still getting ready, pulling shirts out of my closet and finding problems with each one, trying on one outfit and not liking how it looked. I would fix my hair a certain way and be unsatisfied with the way I had it. Eventually, I threw something on and put up my hair and walked out the door, upset. On the way to the restaurant, I looked out my window. I saw a homeless man. As we drove further down the road, I saw a second homeless man, this one seemingly with only one bag to his name. There I was with maybe my seventh outfit on, and there he was with one simple bag. Every morning we are reminded by Mr. Graff to become more selfless and less selfish. And this he echoes the words of Micah 6, 8, when the, Lord, when the Lord tells us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Selfishness, of course, is all around us, but so is selflessness. By reminding ourselves of these moments, we may be encouraged. Acts of selflessness are seen in the Bible, in African American history, and in baseball. Luke 10, 25-37 tells you, or Je- Luke, in Luke 10, 25-37, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, of a man who was robbed while walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was stripped of his clothes and beaten. A priest saw the man and passed by on the other side. Next, a Levite saw the man. The Levite as well passed by on the other side. Finally, a Samaritan saw the man and took pity on him. The Samaritan bandaged him, poured oil and wine on him, and took him to an inn and took care of him. In this story, we clearly see the selflessness of the Samaritan, but we also see what he had to overcome in order to be selfless. He had to overcome the worry of what others might think. The man that was robbed is assumed to be a Jew because when Jesus told this story, his audience was Jewish. This faith with the Samaritan did a risk. The Samaritan, as a footnote in my mother's Bible says, was, quote, a hated foreigner, end quote, in that territory. He was viewed as, quote, a half-breed, both physically and spiritually, end quote. The Samaritan becomes more selfless by not worrying about the fact that he is a slight and worrying instead about the man who has been stripped of his clothes and beat. The Samaritan saw the need of another person instead of the possible risk to himself. Another story that illustrates this idea is that of Ruby Bridges and Mrs. Henry. Mm -hmm. Ruby Bridges was born in 1954, the same year that the United (coughs) States ordered the integration of public schools and the court case Brown v. Board of Education. (coughs) District District Court Judge Wright ordered New Orleans to design a plan for the desegregation of their schools. After much conflict from locals to secure state legislation to overturn Wright's decision, the plan to integrate New Orleans was put into place in 1960. On the morning of November 14, 1960, federal marshals drove six-year-old Ruby and her mother to William France Public School. As they got out out of the car, protesters shouted and shook their fists. Ruby held her mother's hand and walked the steps to the door of the school, escorted by two other marshals. Ruby and her mother sat in the principal's office, and from the window, Ruby watched white parents pointing at them and yelling, then rushing their children out of the school. Ruby remembered that, quote, one man had a black doll in a coffin, end quote. The second day of school, Ruby met her teacher, Mrs. Henry. Ruby walked into the classroom, and every desk was empty, so she picked a seat at front, and Mrs. Henry started her lessons. Mrs. Henry made school fun, as Ruby later said. She said that because of Mrs. Henry, she was, quote, able to forget the outside world, end quote. When Ruby came back to school her second grade year, Mrs. Henry was gone. Ruby found out that Mrs. Henry hadn't been invited to return. Mrs. Henry's selflessness is similar to the Good Samaritans. Mrs. Henry had to overcome what people might think. The people outside outside the doors of the school were full of hate. They were disgusted that Ruby was in the school, but what made it worse from their hateful point of view was that a white woman was teaching her. Even within the doors of school, even within the doors of the school, the atmosphere was less than kind. Mrs. Henry recounts in Ruby's book, Through My Eyes, that none of the faculty lifted a finger to make Ruby's life easier. The principal was a rigid, prejudiced woman who gave me no guidance nor help. Ruby and I were both treated as unwelcome outsiders. Mrs. Henry goes on to say that in the teacher's lounge, The other teachers at first ignored her or made unpleasant remarks about the fact that she was willing to teach a black child. But through it all, Mrs. Henry, as Ruby said, was one of the most loving people I had ever known. She didn't worry about the thoughts, words, and actions of those people towards herself. Instead, she worried about the thoughts, words, and actions of those people towards Ruby. 
She viewed Ruby as, quote, truly someone special, end quote. And neither her nor Ruby missed a single day of school that year, regardless of the amount of protesters on the streets. But of course, Mrs. Henry is not the only person in this story that is more selfless and less selfish. Every morning that Ruby walked to school, she would pray for the protesters around her. She asked God to be with those people and forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Ruby's mother always told her, you have to pray for your enemies and people who do you wrong. And that's what I did, Ruby said. Ruby Bridges was only six years old, yet because of her determination and her selflessness, the next year there were no marshals, no protesters. There were other black kids, even a, there were other kids, even other black students. All because Ruby Bridges didn't give up on her education and her teacher didn't give up on her. Now Ruby and Mrs. Henry travel the country telling their story to school children, inspiring them to, un to understand that every child is a unique human being fashioned by God. Ruby wants school to be a place to bring people together, kids of all races and backgrounds. Ruby stated in an article in Guidepost Magazine that her work in the school is her way of continuing what God set in motion 40 years ago when he led her up the steps of William France Public School into a new world with her teacher, Mrs. Henry, a world that under his protection has reached far beyond the two of them in that classroom. Another type of selflessness comes with letting the good overpower the bad in life. This type of selflessness is portrayed by Lou Gehrig, who played baseball for the New York Yankees and became known as Iron Horse because of his 2,130 consecutive games. He played despite a broken thumb, a broken toe, and back spasms. He batted 295 in 1925, and the next year he hit 313. Gehrig had 47 home runs in 1927. The only other player who had more was Babe Ruth. In 1939, however, Gehrig began to struggle. He became, an Ill, he became ill and weak, and within eight games, he managed only four hits. He was diagnosed with a very rare form of ALS, which is now known as Lou Gehrig's disease. The disease attacks the nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. The motor neurons die, resulting in, a, in the loss of muscle control. The disease is fatal, and most of the people who contract it are given three to five years to live. Despite this prognosis, when his baseball career was forced to come to an end, Gary told a crowd of more than 62,000 at Yankee Stadium, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Speaking of his teammates, he told the crowd how lucky he was to know these grand men and the builder of baseball's greatest empire. Gary said his life was the, quote, finest he knew. He ended the speech with the following words, I may have had a bad break, but I have an awful lot to live for. Lou Gehrig was selfless because he was able to look at the positives in his life. The selflessness of his parents must have influenced him in that regard. In his farewell speech, Gehrig said, When you have a father and mother who, who work all their lives so you can have an education and build your body, it's a blessing. Barbara Haberman, Haberman writes in an article about Gehrig that his parents worked tirelessly to make ends meet. Gehrig said, Gehrig had so much to complain about. He had to had a disease that ended his career and within three years would end his life. Yet Gehrig was more selfless and less selfish. In the face of death, he was the luckiest man on the face of the earth. His disease was merely a bad break, and his life was the finest he knew. Being more selfless and less selfish is an important quality to have. To enact selflessness takes a willingness to overcome what others might think or do, which leads to the ability to, as Lou Gehrig did, make the good in life overpower the bad. Selflessness takes time and thought, but if we remember the stories of people such as the Good Samaritan, Lou Gehrig, Mrs. Henry, and Ruby Bridges, we can, as Psalm 119, 36, 37, and 39 says, turn our heart, hearts towards God's statutes and not towards selfish shame. Our eyes will be turned away from looking at worthless things, and we will be renewed by God. We will be with God whose judgments are good.